Hi everybody, welcome back to RSA Conference 2023. This is theCUBE's continuous coverage, day three. It's Wednesday, hump day here at the, at the show. Last night, it was just packed. So many parties, you know, we were bouncing around. John Furrier's on his way up because he's stuck in traffic because he's coming up from, uh, from Palo Alto, but he's, he's, he's got all kinds of information that he's been digging. He and I were out last night, got some good, good action going. But um, yeah, so, People are saying there's probably 40 to 50,000 people here. I haven't heard the official numbers. I, I, my guess was 50,000. It's actually amazingly packed. Uh, we had the keynotes this morning. Uh, one of our guests, uh, John Chambers, who's coming on later, it was uh, speaking at the keynote in a little fireside chat. He was talking about the lack of urgency in the industry, so we're going to ask him about that. And there's been a big week in earnings. Uh, Microsoft announced they beat their earnings last night. Uh, Google has announced. I wanted to take a minute to un unpack some of the cloud action. As you know, we followed that very closely here. Uh, and the other news is uh, the UK is, UK regulators are blocking the Microsoft acquisition of Activision. I don't know if you guys heard that, but uh, you know, we thought that was going to go through. We thought it was going to be, have some conditions that the UK was going to put on it. But, but it looks like they're going to try to kill it. And so that's a big blow to Microsoft. I mean, they were basically going to transform their entire gaming business to, to be online and basically a cloud-based business, and that looks like it's really in jeopardy. This is another example of governments around the world basically you know, trying to halt you know, the acquisition posture of big tech on the potential that it could limit competition. It's really seeing a shift in sort of the, the pendulum swinging sort of away from sort of the business-friendly posture that we've seen historically. Uh, we certainly know Lena Khan in the United States, the head of the, the chair of the FTC, is, is definitely on a mission to scrutinize more closely. That's an understatement. Uh, big tech generally and big tech acquisition specifically, we certainly saw the US government was very unsupportive of the ARM acquisition by NVIDIA, NVIDIA sort of didn't really didn't support that. In fact, it, I think it sued NVIDIA. And so, so we're seeing a, just a change in posture there. So Activision is the latest. But back to Microsoft's earnings, they beat earnings. Uh, the stock is up today quite nicely. Uh, it's up you know, high single digits. And Azure came in at about, we had it at about 30% uh, uh, growth. They came in at about 31% growth in constant currency. So we were right on our number. Uh, GCP, uh, Google announced, Alphabet announced. You know, it's interesting, we follow Google very closely. We, we listen really carefully to the to the announcements that they make, their language, their earnings posture. As you know, only AWS really reports what we would call clean IaaS, infrastructure as a service revenue. So you take AWS, and it's harder to make an apples to apples comparison across the big three clouds. AWS, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, and Microsoft, Azure. Because Google and Microsoft bundle in their, their other software, their application software. Uh, so, for instance, Office 365 is in Microsoft's cloud number. Uh, Google's sort of workspaces is in Google's cloud number. However, each company gives clues as to the growth rate and the relative performance. So, for example, Microsoft actually reported that it, its Azure business grew 31% in constant currency. The problem is they never tell you, and they have never have historically, what that number is, what the absolute number is. So we've had to triangulate going back, you know, I don't know, four or five years. So I'll talk about where we have that number. GCP is a little different. So GCP will tell you that their cloud business was seven and a half billion dollars this quarter. Now normally what they do, and they did as well, is they will give a relative performance of GCP, sorry, Google Cloud, they'll give you a number, seven and a half billion. I might have misspoken there, but Google Cloud was 7.5 billion in the quarter. Now normally what Google has said historically, going back you know, a few years now, that Google Cloud, GCP, the language used to be on the earnings call, significantly, the growth of GCP significantly outpaced that of the overall Google Cloud. That language changed about a year ago Maybe, a, maybe five quarters ago, four or five, I can't remember exactly, where Google then moderated that and, then, and said GCP grew faster than the overall cloud business. So we inferred from that that okay, the, the gap between Google cloud growth and, and, and GCP was, was, was closing. The GCP was higher, but it was closing. This quarter, they basically said GCP remains strong 
across the board in all regions, in all industries. My estimate is that Google Cloud actually grew more slowly than Google's overall cloud business. So, so you've, got, you've got Google Cloud growing by their numbers at 28%. I'm guessing that's constant currency, but I'm not positive. Um, actually, it may not be. Uh, I had 28% for GCP. I think that number's lower. I think it's more like 21 to 22%. Uh, but Alphabet uh, grew 3% overall. It had a $70 billion top line. And it had an operating profit in its cloud division the first time ever. I mean, remember, it was, it was losing billions in its cloud division, so that's a real positive uh, to focus on. Um, and then AWS announces later on this week, word is they're going to, there's some, some rumors that even AWS is going to have layoffs. So that's a big deal because AWS is the profit driver. Everybody expected that the, that, that the AWS side of the business would not be impacted by, by uh, 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 headcount reductions. I've got AWS growing at 15% this quarter, year on year. Others, I think, have them somewhat lower, and we've heard conversations that a Q2 forecast are down as low as 10%. Now, people may think, and do think, that that's a, that's a sign that uh, uh, Amazon is losing share. And they are. Uh, uh, no question that Azure grew, grew faster and gained share this quarter. I mean, at, at 30%, it's you know, clearly it appears to be anyway growing, uh, gain, growing its share. We'll see when uh, Amazon announced, but I don't think Amazon's going to be growing at 30%, no way. Um, Google's a bit of a concern because they're much smaller. So here's the numbers. My estimates are that a Amazon, AWS, when they announce, will come in just above 20 billion for the quarter. Let's call it 21 billion. That's about 15% growth year on year. I've got Azure at 17 billion, or about 30% growth in constant currency. GCP growing 20 to 21% at 3.5 billion. So you can see the delta. I mean, we're talking about you know, 6x, one sixth Amazon's business. But notice at 21 billion and 17 billion, that, that delta, this is just an attempt to be apples to apples with infrastructure as a service. You can see that there's a compression between Azure and, and AWS. So we'll see what, what's happening there. And again, the, the companies don't report apples to apples, but through you know, various research and analysis and surveys and other discussions, we try to triangulate that and take our best shot. We're one of the few companies that actually does try to do an apples to apples comparison. Meta, of course, is next. Later on this week, we'll be hearing from them. I also want to talk about just the general climate. Uh, we talked about this yesterday a little bit with John, John Furrier. We got, we got a weird situation going on, right? And there's more talk now of a soft landing. Soft landing meaning that the Fed's actions to raise rates and stall the economic growth really is an e effort to, to, to fight inflation. The concern is that'll cause a hard landing, which would be a, a big recession. There's more talk now about a soft landing because you've really got a mixed case. You've got most earnings now coming in above expectations, so we're not seeing a lot of, I think I, think I saw the number, 80% of earnings thus far this quarter are above forecasts, have, have hit or beat their, their consensus forecast, so that's a good sign. Now nobody's really, there's not a broad increase in outlook. People aren't, beating and raising, they're, they're beating. So there's still a lot of conservatism, but I think that conservatism uh, coming into this quarter, it was a good thing. But you're seeing obviously banks are down. Uh, you know, First Republic is, can, continues to be under fire, even though the big banks are just fine. GM is up. I mean, GM had a great quarter and, and raised. They're one of the companies who did raise. Consumer staples are benefiting from higher inflation. So things like toothpaste and diapers and you know, detergent and, and Coca-Cola and McDonald's are more expensive. Housing obviously is softer after the big run-up. Google, from its results, we saw advertising down. We'll see what happens with Facebook. You know, and tech and cloud generally is, is down. But since, since the beginning of the year, actually since October, people that bought the dip actually have done pretty well. <laughs> but, but it's still a lot of uncertainty out there and a lot of, as I say, conservatism in the numbers. Um, the other thing is, and we've reported on this, that the Series C funding, or growth funding, really, has dried up. And there's a lot of funding that's from VCs that's shifting now into early stage. I think VCs are all excited. Everybody's excited about GPT and foundation models. VCs are particularly excited because it means they can start more companies for less money. So if you're a venture capitalist and you've got, let's say you got a bunch of money, let's say you got you know, five, 10, 15, maybe even 100 million in, 
to a Series C company, 100 million might change your posture a little bit, but let's say you've got a bunch of money into a Series C company, and that company's got to do a down round, is going to go wash out their, their existing shareholders to a certain extent, the employees, so they're going to be demotivated. You got to bring in some other outside investors. You got to really rethink about, you know, okay, how are we going to retool this company if they're not cash flow positive or at least fundamentally uh, profitable, inherently profitable. So what would you do? Would you put more money into that entity or would you say, hey, let's, let's start identifying companies that we can start that can really drive AI, because that's the next big wave, and of course we know VCs, you know, they would much rather have you know, a 10% hit rate on a, on a 100X or even a 1,000X return you know, than a 90% hit rate on a, on a 1.2X return, of course. So unlike Tiger Management, which is a huge hedge fund, which you know, recapped its whole portfolio, which puts in big, big money looking for, a, you know, let's call it a, a 1.5x return because the numbers are so big, the net is so big. VCs obviously play a different game. And so that's a, that's a, there's a lot of conversations about the shift in investing mentality. So that's something that, you know, we're, we're watching. Now here at RSA, you know, there's a, there's a lot of conversation, certainly from the vendor community about optimism. You know, we're, we're, we, we're, we're hearing it all over that, that we're optimistic, um, it, the, you know, we, we, looking forward, the p possibility for generative AI to do good things is great. You know, I, <laughs> I guess I'm an optimist, but I'm a realist as well, because the other piece of the narrative that you hear is we got to spend more. But we spend more every year, but it doesn't seem to make us safer. Even though our security is better, we just don't seem to be safer. So that's something that we've been poking at a little bit, because most security chest wounds, if you will, open chest wounds, are self-inflicted. So it's unclear why spending more is going to be <laughs> you know, an answer. Uh, and, and you know, look, despite heavy investments in cybersecurity, you know, people are still falling victim to, to cyber attacks. So you know, you, it begs the question, are tech vendors over-promising? Uh, you know, that's been a, a hallmark of technology companies for years. Is, you know, they promise the moon and, you know, they deliver, you know, or they promise the, you know, the stars and they deliver the moon, maybe I should say. Um, there's also a lot of talk about foundation models, of course. I mean, everybody's talking about AI. We've not found clear evidence from talking to uh, the big threat intelligent companies, you know, think Mandiant, think Palo Alto's Unit 42. We got a lot of CrowdStrike folks coming on today and we'll ask them. We've not seen or heard from them that there's clear evidence that the attackers are using foundation models like G GPT to actually invoke attacks. Now, that doesn't mean they're not doing it. As John Furrier pointed out yesterday, Dave, I guarantee that they're doing this, but they haven't seen clear indications yet in terms of signatures that they can definitely say are you know, GPT driven. And I think part of the, the, the attacker uh, approach is going to be to hide those signatures, use AI to hide those signatures. So that's a big you know, discussion. But there's also, of course, a discussion on the upshot of generative AI. You know, uh, we talked to uh, 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 Google about this, Sunil, Sunil Padi said, look, we're going to focus on the, the low risk, high return areas, and what are those? So one of the things that was really interesting in the, in the Palo Alto Unit 42 Threat Intelligence Report is that that 80% of the alerts come from 5% of the rules. Okay, so, and, it, and this has been this, the case for years, so what does that mean? That means that SecOps pros are getting inundated with the same types of alerts, and they're struggling to prioritize. So per, perhaps generative AI and, and AI, you know, generally can be used to help prioritize, and maybe even take action on some of those alerts, and maybe even sift out the ones that aren't, aren't critical. So, you know, the, the, other, the other sort of point of discussion, which is kind of interesting, is cybersecurity, you know, often leads, breaches often lead to significant financial and reputational losses, so should security vendors be held financially or legally accountable for failing to prevent breaches? You know, and if so, under what circumstances and to what extent, you know, can and should cyber companies, you know, cover those situations? Um, and what, what role will public policy play and the government play in kind of enforcing that. So I don't think anything's going to happen soon, but it's a discussion that's been, been coming up. And you know, the other piece of that, when you think about public policy and the US government, obviously they have tremendous capabilities 
in, in cyber, how aggressive should the U.S. government be in terms of its response to nation state attacks? On the one hand, you know, we could do some damage as the United States. On the other hand, we got a lot to lose with critical infrastructure. So we had a lot, big discussion yesterday on theCUBE about uh, uh, securing critical infrastructure like power plants and dams and reservoirs and things of that nature, which are you know, so important, obviously, to you know, the, the stability of the economy and the general health of, 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 of people and nations. Okay, so today, big day here. I mean, some of the things that we've you know, covered this week are just you know, an amazing you know, two days so far. We're getting into day three. Uh, John Furrier's on his way, and, and he's, gonna, he's been out you know, doing some great research last night. He's got so many great contacts. You know, you walk around the, 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 the area here with John, everybody knows him, he, all the VCs know him. We, we popped into a VC meeting last night, a little meet up, you know, John was holding court. It was, it was amazing to see him in action. And so, really plugged into the scene and knows what's going on. So we're going to pick his brain about what he learned last night. John Chambers is coming on. Again, you're talking about a sense of urgency. John is a longtime friend of theCUBE, so we're super excited to have him. Lee Klarich is the Chief Product Officer of Palo Alto Networks. They've been a big supporter of theCUBE as well and helped us you know, get to RSA Conference this year. We're super excited to have on Zias Caravalla. He's coming on 11.30. Uh, so Lee is on 11 o'clock uh, uh, West Coast time. Nayaki Nayar is coming on. She's the CEO of Securonix, uh, so new CEO there. Uh, we've got some uh, folks from Fortinet coming on, and that's going to be really interesting. Some threat intelligence people. Apiro is kind of an interesting startup in this space. We got a number of folks coming on from uh, CrowdStrike, their chief product officer. Uh, we got some folks from Sunrise Security coming on. Michael Santonis is also coming on. He's the former CTO of CrowdStrike. They just named him president of the company, so we're going to get their perspectives. So it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of theCUBE, as usual. We're here on Broadcast Row in Moscone West. Stop by and see us if you're here at Moscone. If not, check out siliconangle.com. Rob Hof and his team are cranking out all the news. Duncan Riley, Mike Wheatley, Maria Deutscher, our newest uh, journalist, David Strom is here, getting all the stories. Mark Albertson is here, he's out watching the keynotes, digging, digging deep and, and, and getting all the story they're feeding us. So go to siliconangle.com, thecube.net is where you'll find all the videos uh, from this and other shows. So we're kicking off day three, Wednesday, at RS, RS, RSA Conference 2023. You're watching theCUBE, we'll be right back at Moscone West, right after this short break. <laughs>